Okay, at this point we'll be demonstrating the vital sign skills. We'll start with the pupil area response. This is the pen light that I showed you earlier. What you'll do is you'll turn the light on by depressing the clip and you'll have the patient turn and look at you. You'll ask them to look at your nose or a fixed point on your face and then you'll activate the light, move it into the pupil and out of the pupil and what you're looking for is the pupil to respond or contract with the additional light uh, and that will indicate that they are reactive. Uh, so you'll do one side and then you'll do the other side. What you don't want to do is go right up to the patient and then turn the light on. So that'll make them blink, that'll cause some other responses, and won't give you an accurate reading. So again, activate the light, slide it into the pupil and out, then go to the other side, move it into the pupil and out, and you're looking to make sure that they're both reactive and equal. When I say equal, what we're looking for is the size of the pupil. So you'll take your pupillary gauge that's on your pen light and look at the pupils themselves and compare the size of the pupillary uh, gauge to the actual pupils themselves and see that they are equal in size. And this is how we come up with the uh, term PEARL, pupils equal and reactive to light. Next, you're going to need a watch that has a second hand. You're going to take the patient's pulse. Now, you can take the pulse at the radial site, you can take it at the brachial site, you can take it at the carotid site. For the purposes of today, we're simply going to take the pulse at the radial site. Here is the radial bone, which is on top, and then as you flex the hand, you'll find the ligaments that are between the radial bone and the ligaments. Right in between those two places is where you'll find the radial artery. You'll put moderate pressure with two fingers. You don't want to use your index finger because you have a pulse in your index finger. Use your second and third finger and you'll press and release just slightly and you'll feel the pulse bound. At that point, what you want to do is bend the patient's arm, lay it against their chest, and begin to count. You can count for 15 seconds and then multiply that number by four. You can count by 30 seconds and multiply it by two. You want to get a count of how many times the heart is beating in one minute. That will give you your pulse rate. The benefit of putting the hand on the patient's chest is now you can move to their respiratory rate without them knowing it. You know that when you go to the doctor and they say, well, we're going to count your respirations, and they now sit and they look at your chest rise and fall, the patient now thinks about it, and so they change their respiratory rate because they're aware that you're counting it. It's not that you necessarily have to be sneaky about it, it's just the concept that when you're done counting, the radial pulse, one of the nice things that you can do is you can feel the rise and fall of the chest while you're touching the patient's chest and you'll just continue to count to get that number over the course of one minute. As the patient's chest rises and falls, that's one breath and you will count that for one minute. The slower the pulse rate is or the slower the respiratory rate is, the longer you need to count it to get an accurate rate. So, if their pulse is in the 40s, you probably need to count it for an entire minute to get an accurate pulse rate. And same thing with the respiratory rate, if it's only 6, 8, 10, you need to count it for an entire minute to get an accurate rate, as opposed to 15 uh, seconds and, and multiplying it by 4 and 30 seconds uh, multiplying it by 2. Um, so, we've checked the pulse rate. You, again, can check it at the radial artery the brachial artery, the carotid artery, and we've checked the respiratory rate. Rise and fall of the chest is one breath, uh, and you're going to count that for one minute. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to uh, measure the blood pressure. In doing so, we're going to take the blood pressure cuff, and we're going to take the cuff and place it around the bicep area. This is where the brachial artery is, is right above the bend of the arm. You need to find the brachial artery first before you place the blood pressure cuff uh, on. You don't want to cover the brachial artery uh, with the blood pressure cuff. You just simply want to put it right above it. And you want to secure the blood pressure cuff so that it is tight um, uh, and uh, that you can just get one finger underneath the cuff. If you have a lot of extra space, that won't give you an accurate reading. 
you also uh, want to use good technique. So one of the things that I would recommend is to ask the patient to just um, hold on to your arm or hold their arm with your arm and then that way they're not using their muscles to hold their arm up. Your sphygmomometer has a clip that can clip on to the blood pressure cuff. If that doesn't seem to be working or it's not in a place where you can see it, you can have the patient hold it for you. If they're not in a place there where they can hold it, you can clip it onto their clothing, whatever it is that you need to do to get it in place where you can see it. Now, you've found where the brachial artery is, so you're going to take your uh, diaphragm of the stethoscope and place it right over that site. You don't need to press it hard, you just need to put it over that site, and as long as you're over the site, then you'll be able to hear the blood pressure. As you turn the stopcock valve to the right, that closes the valve, and you begin to put pressure into the gauge or the sphygmometer. In this case, they're a healthy, normal patient. We're going to pump it up to about 160 to 180 millimeters of mercury. At that point, we'll release the blood pressure um, or the stopcock gauge and allow the needle to fall at a steady rate. Okay? As I say steady rate, there is no uh, specific uh, time reference as it falls. You just want it to fall at a steady rate. You don't want it to go too slow and you don't want it to go too fast because again those will affect your readings. Um, you simply want it to fall at a steady rate and what you're listening for is the first beat that you hear. The first beat that you hear wherever it is on the gauge is now the top number of the blood pressure, the systolic number. Whatever that number is, uh, that is the systolic number. It will be strong and bounding, and then it will become fainter and fainter and fainter with each beat. And as it, the last beat that you hear, and you no longer can hear uh, anymore, that last one that you heard was the diastolic number. So you have a systolic number over a diastolic number, and this is the skill of auscultating a blood pressure. So you'll place your earpieces in, you'll turn the stopcock, valve to the right, you'll put in some pressure up to approximately 180 millimeters of mercury, you'll allow the needle to fall, and his blood pressure is 110 over 72, and that is within the normal range for a healthy adult. Uh, it is uh, relatively quiet uh, sound, so you need to be in an atmosphere where you can actually hear it. Now, in emergency services, you may not be in a location in which uh, you can auscultate the blood pressure. So you may need to palpate the blood pressure. When we say palpate it, that is a term of feeling something. So you can either palpate the radial artery or the brachial artery. Either way, you're going to feel where the pulse is and you'll pump up the blood pressure again to approximately 180, in this case because he's a normal healthy adult and you'll allow the needle to fall, and then the first beat that you feel, the first beat that you feel in the radial site, that is now the systolic number. You cannot get a diastolic number in doing a palpated blood pressure. You can only get one value. That would be the systolic number. In this case, it was 98 over, uh, or I'm sorry, 98 systolic. There is no diastolic number. That's palpating a blood pressure. And that would be in the case where you can't hear um, because of external noises or in some cases where the blood pressure is so low, uh, the only way you can do it is to feel it with the brachial artery and uh, palpate the blood pressure. So what we've done is we have done the pulse rate, we've done the respiratory rate, we've done the blood pressure and the pupils. We also need to do the skin signs. The skin signs, you would simply uh, feel the skins with the back of your hand. If they're exposed to the elements, you want to go to the core of the body. You want to look at color, uh, temperature, and moisture. Those are the three things that you'll evaluate with skin signs. The color is something you can simply see. The temperature is something that you feel. And the moisture is something that you'll feel. Again, if they're exposed to the elements, that will uh, change how they're um, skins appear or feel that are exposed to the elements, so you may need to get under the clothing in order to get an accurate picture of what the skin signs are. 
Uh, and then finally, um, an additional skill is listening to lung sounds. When you listen to lung sounds, you'll simply put your stethoscope in place and you'll need to go to the bare skin in order to listen to lung sounds. In this case, um, remember that you have different lobes in the lungs, but we're always going to compare the one side to the other. So if you were listening anteriorly, you'd listen underneath the scapula because the bone would certainly create a problem for you to hear any of the sounds. So you'll listen one side, then the other, then one side, then the other, and then one side, and then the other. The best place is to listen on the back. And if you're over the scapula bones, again, you're not going to be able to hear, so you need to go inside the scapulas, below the scapulas on both sides, and then to the very lowest lobes. Uh, that's listening to lung sounds, and you'll discuss that in great length uh, during the course and what sounds you're listening for. These are the vital signs skills. You need a watch with a second hand, uh, you need a stethoscope, a blood pressure cuff, and a pupil um, uh, pin light to test it. You don't want to use a flashlight or a large big beam that has a lot of candle watt power because you'll do damage to the eyes. That is the skill for vital signs.